I'm going to talk about a site in Eastcote, which is West London. I might have spoken about part of it before or shown part of it before, but we started in 2012 and that's getting on for nine years ago now and things change and we pull conclusions together and um, I hope you'll enjoy it. There will be pictures of people mingling and standing closer than two metres uh, apart, but this was seven or eight years ago so it doesn't really matter but you some of you might find that worrying there are no skeletons there's no pictures of of dead people although some of our volunteers because this is a volunteer attended site some of them have of course passed on in the interim so we were employed or um taken on by the heritage lottery fund to do some archaeology in Eastcote House Gardens, which is in the uh, the west of London, as I said, not far from Harrow and Ryslip. The Friends of the Gardens um, put in a bid for lottery funding and that was matched by um, donations. And we looked at a, a house called Eastcote House, which was demolished in 1964. These are two pictures of it, one just before demolition on the right of the screen and one on the left during demolition on the left of the screen. So what we thought we were looking at was the remains of a two storey um, mansion with rooms in the attic and a partial basement underneath and this single storey cottage building on the right. That's actually um, this thing where I've got my little red pointer. That, that one was actually the butler's quarters and leading on to the uh, kitchens and eventually round to carriage house and stables. On the left here is a picture taken on a Sunday. There was a local chap on his way to church one Sunday morning, noticed it was being knocked down in 1964 and took some pictures. There are videos on YouTube of Eastcote being knocked down. This is a kind of cross section through the main house. You can see one of the large chimneys here is probably the central one here with um, quite an old fashioned looking roof, chimney stack in the foreground my, where my red pointer is, carrying flues and then a lot of wood in the foreground. It turned out that most things were bulldozed into the cellar upon demolition, apart from the wood which was all burnt and that included, it turned out, when we went back to the records, 16th century oak panelling. I mean, what else would you do with oak panelling but bulldoze it and burn it into the, uh, burn it and bulldoze it into the cellar? Um, a lot of the decorative elements, you can see there's a little porch here at the front with columns. That was um, Italian marble that was just broken up and put into the cellars. A lot of the fireplaces inside, you can see one there on the left picture with my laser pointer um that's marble as well i think it's carrera i think that's a place in italy that provides some of the best white marble with blue streaks so we did some research on the house ably um, abetted by the local history society and friends of east coat house so that we could actually learn a bit about the place before we went there after we went there and whilst we were digging So here's an old picture that was um, brought up. This little building on the right here, that's the back of the building that I said was the, um, the butler's rooms and, and the kitchens. This building, this two, tall two-storey buildings is more parts of the attendances because the rich people who were known, whose family name was Banks at one point, lived in the main house. And these are all the attendant houses that you don't really see unless you work there. As we come left, there's a coach house and then a stable house. This picture again was taken in 1964, shortly before demolition. One of the advantages actually of having people in the local area coming along, we could ask them about it. Did they remember going in? Do they remember ever seeing it? But 1964 is 56, going on 57 years ago now. And although, um, people have memories by the time you're reaching your 90s when an, you might have been an adult to visit it back in the 1960s um, memories are not always as accurate as they used to be and if you're younger then you were probably only two or three 
perhaps when you visited that and your memory isn't as accurate as it could be either. But some people did speak to us and some people said, oh, we were very naughty, we went inside and played. Um, no one said, oh, we were very naughty and threw stones through the window. But some of them did attend uh, Cubs and Brownies there and get their vaccinations. And also in the 1950s, people would go there in the last days of this building with their ration books uh, to collect their ration books. So it's always worthwhile speaking to the local people because although as an archaeologist, we don't know everything and you can't be local to everywhere, if, if you can speak to the local people and the local history societies and see who can contribute their knowledge, then we can have a um, enhanced learning, if you like. Now, this is the only building that was left standing after demolition. So all this was gone. All this is gone. The only thing that's left is this stable block, which is how it looked in 2012. We've got a nice ancient end on the um, gable end of the building on the left. We've got a nice ancient top floor there in this main picture. And this ground floor is a 1930s addition uh, when they converted the stables into a pool room for the local pool club. So we've got all our lovely timber framed there with the wall plates there and the roof plate up here, um, the vertical posts, these diagonal ones stop the frame from bending in the wind. They're called wind braces. To stop the walls from falling outwards, this all dates to about 1600, by the way, 1598. The, the timbers were felled in 1598. So obviously the building went up after that, but probably not long after. But this horizontal beam here, which runs from side to side across the building, that's called a tie beam, and that ties the two sides of the building together at roof level and stops them falling out under the weight of the roof. We did a little thing with school children that came along and helped us and got them to count the tiles on the roof. And there's about a uh, 100 this way and about a 100 that way. So there's something like 10,000 tiles on each side of the roof. Each tile weighs a pound. So I think that's 20,000 pounds worth of tiles. And my maths is terrible and so is my understanding of imperial measurements, but that's something like 20 tons on a roof. That's how much the roof weighs and it's supported each, each time there's a large cross member like this, just on two little struts, which transfers all that weight to the tie beam, which then transfers the weight to the walls. Wood is a remarkable, remarkable building um, material, as well as shows that this and other buildings all around the country dating to about 1600, lots of them survive. Once you take the roof off, they fall to pieces because it's really the roof that's holding them together. What we did discover when we went there was this wall was actually falling off completely. It's departing, it's just been patched, if you like, to the end wall. That has since been rebuilt in a much more sympathetic style using old timbers and old bricks from uh, similar properties in the area of Ryslip, Harrow, Rainers Lane, that, that sort of area. We did actually record this in entirety. We used something called a laser scanner, which is a now a machine that you just set up on a tripod and it measures a point. We could set it up for every centimetre and you let it alone and you come back in a couple of hours and it's surveyed the whole thing for you. Personally, I like drawing, but we can't all stand in the way of progress, always. So the first time we went to Eastcote was in 2012, and we had some volunteers from the local um, garden society, Friends of Eastcote House. These people, some of who I can name as uh, Val, Rosemary, Colin, couldn't tell you, couldn't tell you, <laughs> Leslie, and two others. These are all Friends of Eastcote House, and they spend their spare time gardening in the grounds, which you can see in this a photograph look quite extensive. They are, they are, they are quite expensive. They're about, it takes about 10 minutes to walk one way and five minutes to walk the other in a sort of rectangular shape in the gardens and the houses in the middle. So we discovered, and they discovered quite easily, that if you can do gardening, you can do archaeology. If you can kneel down and dig a flower bed, you can kneel in the rubble and sift through soil looking for finds. If you can't do gardening, 
but you can manage washing up, then you can look at the finds that everyone's collected, all the people who become archaeologists by virtue of their training and what they do, you can wash the finds. If you can, so whatever really your age or, or state of being able to stand up or sit down, you should be able to do archaeology. Here we've got a group of what I think are called year four, which in my my age would mean I'm about eight or nine in primary school, um, doing archaeology. They've got little high-vis vests on, they've got little gloves on. Do you know, do you know little little working gloves for children are actually called workwear for children, which I thought that went out in the Victorian period, providing children with workwear, but obviously not. But one of these children actually has this one kneeling down here has an artificial leg, which uh, which really says something about well the keenness of the child to get involved and and um, but even someone without a leg with an artificial leg can actually get down in the mud and sift through and look for finds. I didn't know she had an artificial leg until after I'd said, "Don't cut off your finger on this bit of broken glass; it won't grow back." Only then did she say, my leg didn't, which is a little embarrassing for me, but never mind. So we went there in 2012 and we excavated four trenches to see what survived. And on the strength of that, went back for four more years of digging in 2014, 15, 16, 17 and 18. And in the last year, we've actually put all our um, research and results of our excavations together to try and work out the sequence of the site as well as doing some historical research. But uh, I would say the children absolutely loved it. Some of them, here they are, this is a school trip they've come out and my partner Jill helped me teach them with the archaeology. They'd either come back at weekends or they'd demand to come back the next year during their school class. Here's an overview of the park before we start. So you get an idea of its size there. That trench that we were just looking at uh, was near this tree here, which is a kind of, so it's a weeping tree, but it's not a willow, it's, it's something odd, it's a weeping ash, some kind of odd, rare crossbreed. Anyway, we did start by surveying the park out, and uh, you can see a colleague of mine with his surveying kit there. Gone are the days of plain tables and um, slide rules, we all pay attention to what our surveyor has to say for himself. So we went to the documentary sources to understand what we were looking at. And the first record of the site, um, you can read this. This'll, this is being recorded, I think, Robert and David. So you can look at this later. Don't feel you have to write anything down. You can always go and look back at this. Um, the first record of the site dates to 1494, when Eastcote was called Ascot. And um, the earliest records for Ascot, which I think are um, tax returns, come to 1323. So it wasn't there. Um, during the Doomsday Service uh, survey, but um, we suspect then, although the site of Eastcote is first recorded in 1494, it could date back to as early as 1323. Um, through our archaeology, we can actually date the house to between about 1200 and 1350, because we got pottery from the ground beneath where we found the earliest foundations uh, dating to those periods. So as archaeological levels work, something underneath, something in the lowest layer, if you can date that, anything above that has to be later. It's, it's simple processes, as anyone who does a mathematical flow chart can tell you. If I serve my dinner, I put my dinner on the plate, therefore I must have put the plate down first. That's a simple way of putting it, but that's how we work archaeology. But the 1494 record, which, many, which uh, has been tied into Eastcote House, actually records the owner as one John Amory, lying in extremis, which means he's died, um, surrendered a cottage in two closes called Hopkites and Droker. We think Hopkites became the location where Eastcote House, that big house was, and Droker, back in 2012, when we started our excavations, was an unknown site. But the area of land encompassed by the park is quite large, so it probably now represents both the Hopkite's name and the Droker name, and 12 acres of land for the use of Joan. So we had a little bit of research, 
there must have been a house there by 1494 but what we saw in that demolition photograph and the timber panelling was from the 1600s at the earliest and that uh, stable block was from 1600 so we began to wonder if there was something else on the site our research goes on and we discover that the cottage was owned occupied by the wife of um, said man joan until 1503 and by their son until 1507 and that's when it gets recorded by the name hopkites owned by one john wollaston their owner's daughter winifred married the hawtree family that is a relation to the carry-on actor but only vaguely and the hawtrees inherited hopkites his family are based in checkers so we're actually getting an idea of some kind of that's checkers the country state of the prime minister we're getting some idea of the um, social status of the residents of the site this becomes more apparent in the 17th century when the banks family marry into the hawtrees if i've got that right but the banks family own corf castle and oakhampton and portland bill where portland stone comes from and um some of that stone that we saw on the porch of the house was definitely portland stone so we just go through the residence we find quite long-lived residents at least 40 or 50 years in charge of the house um until we get to 1725 the mp for middlesex people are moving in but the important re thing really is Ralph Hawtree from 1593, resident in the house to, until 1638. He wasn't born in 1598, that's just when he moved in. But um, I'll show you a painting of him shortly. He's wearing a black doublet and a white ruff, looking quite um, high status. His daughter is Mary Hawtree, who married the Banks, the Chief Justice to Charles I, but also the heir to Corf Castle and all that estate of um, land down in Dorset. And they go on and um, they marry into other families, deans. The deans eventually move out in the 1930s to Australia, and the house was given over to the council, which was why it was demolished in 1965, because the council decided it was old and not worth retaining, even though it had this um, quite high status historic background. So, the earliest thing we found in the area of the Hopkites building was this sort of C-shaped arrangement of um, bricks rather poorly mortared together. This is overlying an area of dark soil. That's the soil that we dated to being laid down in the 12 and 1300s. So this C-shaped arrangement of bricks dates to after that. Behind it is another C-shaped arrangement of bricks. You might be able to make it out there where my thing is past this um, two yard long pole well, it's two meters but a yard is the same as a meter and what these are are two the backs of two chimney stacks back to back so the fireplace is here in the middle at the front back to back with a fireplace in the middle at the back you don't get fireplaces like this till about 1550 but that does predate our family um, who, who built the east coat house and the bricks manufactured here are of late medieval into sort of Tudor date. They predate um, Elizabeth I's tax laws. Elizabeth I taxed bricks in 1580 up to a certain size. And because of that, bricks kind of got standardized as a certain size for some centuries. If we move on, we've got another view of this, I believe taken from the other side. Here's our brick chimney. Oh, taken from further on on the same time. Here's the brick base of our chimney stack. But it is right next to these flint wall foundations. The flint wall comes along here, turns left, and then is suddenly abutted to or joined by this brickwork. We had a little archaeological investigation there, and the brickwork overlies further flint foundations, implying to us that the bricks have been added to a building with flint walls. If the addition of brick chimney stacks dates to the 1550s, then we have to assume that our flint walls are part of an earlier building. The um, 
the logic comes come is is clear from the archaeological sequence so we're beginning to we can now if we push our chimney stack to 1550 where these high status people would be very much up to date our flint walls must have already been standing very much built in the medieval style here's another view of the flint wall um, a few bricks incorporated there with a hole for a vertical post there a hole for a vertical post there we think we might have had a doorway perhaps where the masonry stops there behind it this enormously thick wall is actually part of the bigger east coat house that big two-story building that we've got the photographs of that is about three feet wide and about six feet deep and all along the top doesn't show particularly well here a big scars put into the top of the wall by the bulldozers in the 1960s it is so solid it just would not move the um 18th century repairers and 17th century builders of this wall used a mortar and brickwork so strong it just won't move we tried taking it apart it just doesn't move but then if a bulldozer won't move it i doubt with us with our picks shovels and trowels would get very far through it as well we did go through this soil and through the soil and got quite a lot of nice finds and also we found some demolition layers relating to this oldest house which had quite a lot of early finds which we'll come on to when i talk about the finds later in this slideshow no another view of that bit of an angle perhaps you get an idea of the big scratches across the top of the brickwork here and more of an overview of the side of the building so the chimney stacks would be typically put in the middle so if i've got an outer wall here and a chimney stack here the parallel wall to this for a rectangular cottage or house would be somewhere under the tree over here whereas the length of the house if this chimney stacks in the middle we'd be at least as far over in the opposite side as we have there our later house had extensive cellars and unfortunately this is pretty much all we had of the earliest building which we're going to call hopkites uh, according as according to the ancient records here's two likely looking chaps the downhill from the old house we found a ditch it started off with um, as just an area of darker soil against the naturally lying clay of the site these are two of our volunteers uh, this chap um trevor i think was a friend of the uh, gardens and a volunteer and did gardening every day great fan of star trek so nothing wrong with him there has unfortunately died he's far too energetic whereas this chap was just walking his dog one day had sat down um to drink a pint of beer in the park and said oh what are you doing that looks interesting can i join in of course you can we're open to everyone so, someone who was walking their dog and was enjoying a beer in the park seemed quite keen so why not so we got them to excavate an archaeological ditch with material coming about out of it dating to between about 1400 and 1600 so the years of hopkites and we were looking at those foundations and there's not a lot of them left so our second question was where on earth have the rest of the building remains gone one of the funny things we found here here is a 20-sided um lead alloy lead and copper alloy object we have no idea what it's for see how big it is it's by the 20 pence for it's got a hollow cylinder up to about halfway through coming from that end just a hollow tube and a little pointy thing at the top we have no idea what it is but it could be um a little finial off a piece of small piece of furniture or maybe something like a church warden staff I, if any of you've got one do uh do contact us through through the society and say i know what that is it's a dodecahedral polygonal um staff fitting typical of the medieval period actually it's also from this demolition layers here that we got our only piece of silver from the site a um henry the eighth penny amongst the demolition which may have been used as a pendant but we'll come to that later and we can look at some silver so the top of the ditch looked like that when we stopped excavating it looked like that so this is about three feet deep this is a cross section through part of the ditch this is a ditch running round down slope of um, the hopkite's house and we think it's actually 
draining water off the clay soils of Eastcote so that the floors of the house don't get flooded. The more archaeology I do, I do begin to wonder whether or not all human society is based on drainage. Drainage of your own house or drainage of the land so you don't get inundated, especially this year. One of our volunteers on the site a couple of years ago, I went back to talk to them, it had been a particularly wet winter. And um, his whole garden and shed had migrated down the hill of his garden, down his drive and into the streets. So that's just one of the effects of weather. Um, as we look at the cross section here, this is how we understand what's going on. We've got a very dark brown layer at the bottom that had a lot of um, a lot of dark brown soil, which we think is partially probably soil accumulating in the ditch, but also household remains. There are oyster shells in there and small bits of animal bone and what looked like drought up bits of horse poo, to be honest. Won't say lie, it's definitely horse poo in there. There's also bits of um, drinking vessels, quite quite posh imported drinking uh, jars and cups and tankards, uh, plates from the continent, flasks. Interestingly, no smoking pipes because we're looking back at the pre-establishment um, of the American colonies, such as Virginia. If anyone here smokes or has smoked, you might remember Golden Virginia. Where does it come from? Virginia. That's why that's why it has the name. You might be able to say, see some brick rubble above the top here. That is the same sort of bricks as we had in the foundation of the house. And amongst that, we had little bits of diamond shaped window panes, little bits of leading, which are called cames from around the windows. So we started to realize that the, this ditch had been filled up partially with the household rubbish from the Hopkites building and partially when it was demolished for the new house coming in in about 1600 under Ralph Hawtrey, they just flattened the house and filled up the ditch, stops you falling in. But as such, it becomes an invaluable archeological resource. Here's a few examples of what we found is on the left. This is typical of archeological sites for those who haven't dug archeology. span You find a few little fragments. This is centimeters, one, two, three, four, five, uh, 10. So that's four inches in old, in Imperial. So the, these little fragments, sometimes less than an inch across, but these things are made on a potter's wheel back, this one particularly, back between 1350 and 1400. This is typical of a ware called Kingston ware. And by comparing what we have to what is in museums, such as the Museum of London, we know that this pottery fragments on the left would have formed a vessel much like this on the right. It would be nice to find such a thing, but people don't throw these away until they're broken up like this. And the same goes for most archaeological finds. This, for example, one very small fragment of a London tightware jug from 1200 to 1250 would have looked like this. But as we know from our records, um, East Coast wasn't established till the 1300s. So this must, you could say this may be at some kind of heirloom of the family. Everyone keeps heirlooms. Romans kept heirlooms. Romans even collected ancient um, Neolithic finds because they understood what an, an ancient arrowhead looked like. We're, we are the same sort of people as these. These people would have kept an heirloom jug like this on a board at the side of the room. I have a board in the side of, of my room. I call it a sideboard. Cups I would keep on a board as well. That would be my cupboard. We all have those. These are the same sorts of people and they take pride in their nice things in the same way that we do. It's a talking point or, or something you've got nice on your, I was going to say Welsh dresser. What am I living in the Victorian period? The um, 186 fragments came from pottery manufactured in Hertfordshire, dating from between 1200 and 1350. These are reconstituted bowls from Hertfordshire and these are the things that come from the soils before any buildings on the site are recorded. So there are things going on on the site in the 12, 1300s, people eating, these are cooking pots, uh, people cooking and preparing food, at least somewhere nearby, and then discarding their pottery. These things are about um, a foot across and about eight inches high, and they're actually lovely to hold. There's a lot of historicity going there. If um, 
if you ever get a chance to the London Archaeological Archives to visit, you can touch these things that you, they let you feel them, unlike most museum exhibitions where you can't. This is a funny little pot, a tripod pot for, um, is actually, a, I think it's a, well, it's a tripod cooking pot. It's got three feet, so it'll never fall over. Well, you can put it on pretty uneven ground and it won't fall over. You can nestle it in a fire and um, do your cooking that way. Little skillet on the top, little pan. Again, we found big fragments of these. We're moving into the Tudor period for these items. These are things that would have been used by the residents of Hopkite. So the, um, the Amorys, Averys, the, the family who were first recorded there in the 1490s. And you might think this is a very short handle for your frying pan when you're heating this on your fire. I say, Add a wooden handle and it looks exactly like a modern frying pan. Again, these are the same sort of people as us. They have the same needs and their same desire not to burn their hands on their cooking and their stoves and things. These are two complete examples of other things we found. This is a jug from Raren in Germany dating to about 1500. This is for lager. The people in our house hopcates are drinking imported continental lager back in the 16th century. Some things never change. This is called a Martin Camp flask, a roughly oval pottery bottle again, uh, which would have had wine in it and has come over from Spain. So we're drinking, well, perhaps they're drinking something that tastes a bit like Rioja there on the right and drinking something that tastes a bit like, I don't know, posh German lager. I don't, I don't drink lager. And here I've got pictures of the Hawtreys. Ralph Hawtrey on the left, a rather portly looking gentleman, clearly well fed and high status, judging by his clothing, and Mary who he married, and their child went on to marry into the Banks family and bring the riches. But these are the people who founded the Eastcote house and demolished the Hopkites building. Would you fancy would you fancy meeting them on a dark night? Probably they look they look quite quite sensible and normal. Actually, this looks like a friend of mine called Catherine. Hmm. So our excavations revealed the following. We have here from 1936 the RCHME, which eventually became English Heritage, now Historic England, recognized the historic age of the house and recorded the basements. So we have here in dark black, the footprint of East Coat House, the main building, big basements underneath this wall here, little basement in the middle, and another basement there, that's underneath the kitchens and the butler's rooms, and little basement here with shelves shown, which are probably wine cellars. What I've added on here in the light blue, that's all the footprint that we found of the older Hopkites building with our back-to-back -back pair of fireplaces there in the middle. So blue is those old flint walls and that brick base for our fireplace in the middle. It looks like a rectangular building with a central fireplace. Room on either side, probably rooms above. But the big basements and the big walls of our more modern 17th century East Coat House have taken it away. What we've done is overlay on this plan, rather too faintly for my satisfaction, the shapes of the walls that we found, and it matches exactly. English Heritage were, sorry, RCHME were ma mapping at 1 to 96. Uh, we were using 1 to 20 scale plan drawings plus um, a GPS, a kind of modern theodolite thing, and they're a couple of inches out, but come on. No one's really going to argue about a couple of inches. Now, in another field, I couldn't believe there wasn't anything, despite nothing showing up when we did a geophysical survey. That's where you probe the ground with electric probes. You, you'd have seen that on that Time Team program, which probably finished over 10 years ago, but most people um, remember it unless they're under 20 years old. I couldn't believe that there wasn't anything in the meadow, and I was wondering what, what this Droker name meant from that ancient document that mentioned Hopkites and Droga that was um, left in in the in the uh, John Avery will back in 1494 
So we did a test trench. We found some brick foundations here and something flint in the middle. So the following year, in 2017, I made a trench. This is 10 yards long. I made a trench five yards long either side. So we're 10 by 10. And we could fit about 30 volunteers in there all at the same time. I felt that one of these had to be a principal wall, but I couldn't tell if I was inside, outside or in the middle. That's why this line here became the centre of our trench. And one of my favourite finds from that year is this um, uh, panel or, or ceramic little label from Dalton in Lambeth. And it reads, as you can say, to use as urinal, lift the seat. I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that this was designed by a woman for use in, in the toilets in, um, in hop kites for, the, for those who um, didn't sit down to go to the toilet. So if we, uh, I'll move on to archaeology and less of that. So I'll just show you the sequence, a little bit of a sequence of archaeological dig. We hand lifted the turf. That's a great job in the sunshine, lifting turf with spades and found what looked up ploughed up rubble. It has since come to light that a lot of the fields were used during the Second World War for allotments and for um, digging for victory. And again, some of the older residents said, yes, I remember there are allotments here, but they weren't there. They, they were across the river. Again, memories. They, they, things are bigger when you're a child than they are when you're an adult. Things are in different places. I imagine that if I go back to the house I grew up in Reading, I'll be shocked to say, but there used to be an oak tree here. Things change, things change. So we took off um, as much rubble as we could, finding occasional things like this, which is a horseshoe. We found other things like um, rods of iron, um, bill hooks, agricultural implements, which seemed quite out of place when we got this, which is a wide flint wall, about two foot wide marking out the shape of a rectangular building with a very closely um, packed gravel surface on the inside. So this is about a room about 10 feet wide, from side to side here, and about 15 feet this way uh, with a partition which is very hard to see in this bright sunlight. And this is a joy to dig. For those who do archaeology, sometimes we just scrape at mud but sometimes we get a beautiful, beautiful building made out of flint walls. You all know flint, it's this big bulbous um, black and white rock, very uneven. All these walls are faced, the, the flints have been um, struck to be flat. And the way this would have been constructed to get a nice flat wall is the builders would put some pegs in the ground, put some planks along the pegs, you then put your flat faces against the planks, pour mortar down the middle. When it's set, you take the planks off. You've got a perfectly straight wall. Remarkable things, uh, remarkable ingenuity of the human race. I love this building so much, I'm just going to show you lots of uh, slides of it from different angles. In the old days of archaeology, you'd have to consider your photographs very carefully and try and get the perfect one. In these modern days of digital photography, I've got about 200 pictures of this building. And um, of those pictures, only about 10 of them are absolutely perfect. And of those, the best I'm going to try and show you here. This gives us more of the building. So you can see the rectangular foundation here underneath my little red circle. A peculiar red staining there, which I'll come back to during the hot summer. Now isn't that nice? Nice sharp contrast. Sorry, it's my own photo. Isn't that a nice sharp contrast uh, between the whiteness of the flint and the darkness of the shadow shows up really the unevenness of the flint, but also the evenness, how regular and flat that floor is. Of course, all our volunteers had to kneel on this to clean it. Surprisingly comfortable. It's really, really surprisingly comfortable. Here's another view of that with our red stained brickwork but really quite red stained and um, powdery in the foreground. Another view of that. Um, I'll just say that therefore we think we've got a building here, possibly with two rooms and maybe an open courtyard out here with pads for posts, 
or maybe holes where smaller post holes were sighted. This is a nice overview. Again, volunteers working hard. This chap's making a record. Thank you, Colin. Um, this lady's having a rest. Rosemary here, digging out some of the red material, as is Denise. Denise used to make us lovely cakes, actually. She even made one in the shape of an archaeological dig. This is a useful thing, Victorian land drain, straight through the side of our building. Thanks, Victorians. They must have had fun digging that because um, incredibly hard work for us. Oh, I'm going to, I always digress, land drains. Wherever we dig in the countryside amongst clay soil, we find that it has been drained in the past by lengths of land drain. These are about a foot long and about two or three inches wide and are laid, usually running downhill, to um, drain clay land. These were laid four times, typically during the last 200 years. There's a host of them laid between about 1810 and 1815. There's loads laid in the 1850s. There's a lot laid around 1917 and 18, and a lot more laid in about 1944-45. Those all coincide with war, wars, and they're typically laid by prisoners of war let out to do agricultural work. So they hand dig a trench, lay in the drainage. These are also marvellous for planting in parsnips and carrots and any root vegetables you want to uh, grow straight, if you, if you come across any old ones that you may take home with you. Anyway, if we, if we move on, something wasn't making sense. We have a structural pier in our building, and when we excavated around it, a bit of a hollow in the ground, with as well as demolished brick, a lot of burnt material. So I'll just go back a couple of pictures. Well, perhaps where these people are working, I said there was a red area. When we put all the finds together and the layout of the room, we've got an incredibly large piece of flint here. This is shattered in the ground, but it's actually about three foot by two foot. And all over this um, graveled cobbled area, we got magnetic iron debris. We got a couple of horseshoes, some bill hooks, um, the end of a hammer and some square iron rods. We now think that this was probably a blacksmith's. So all the little magnetic debris is hammer scale, where flakes of iron are um, flying off an anvil as they're struck by an iron. The horseshoe and the bill hook remains are what he may have been making or working on. The iron rods of metal are the raw materials that he's making the tools from. And this collapsed area of brickwork is probably a brick chimney which has collapsed in its own flue, thus drawing heat from the um, furnace, which would have been sited on this a massive lump of flint. That's, uh, that's putting two and two together and making four. I don't think we're over stretching the evidence to say that an area with a flue and an area with hammer scale and iron tools is anything other than a furnace and a, and a blacksmith. So I say to my people here, for example, what does finding a coat hanger prove? It proves two other things. It proves one, you have a coat. It proves two, you have a wardrobe. Therefore, the archaeological evidence putting it together by the same sequence of logic stops you just from saying, oh, well, we dug and we dug and we found some stuff to saying we dug and we've actually revealed that in the past, these people in East Coast Maybe the main house, Hopkites, had a more industrial area, including the, the, the Smith's workshop in the South Field or the Lower Field. I just say happy people. Have you ever seen a happier group of people after doing archaeology in temperatures reaching 35 centigrade in the middle of July? You can see how the grass is parching behind them and uh, all the clothes bleached out just because of the sunlight. Now then, I mentioned the 1936 survey um, done by the RCHME. They also tried to date the sequence of buildings as they saw them. So we've got the stables over here. That's that standing building that I saw. There was a garage. That is what was the coach house. Got 18th century building. That was a two-story building. Got modern thing there. This area is that single-story building that I said was um, 
kitchens and butler's rooms, little storehouse there, and the main house down here with that typical room. I live in a Warner house in Walthamstow. My Warner house is less than a quarter of this building in footprint. A typical Victorian semi-detached in Walthamstow is probably about the size of this one room in their house. <laughs> that gives an idea of the scale of their building. Um, but when they did their survey in 1936, they tried to date what they could see by the fixtures and fittings. So they had some 17th century, that's 1600s, timber panels in there. They've got early 18th century for this back area. I think they were judging that from a staircase which had barley twist banisters and no comment about the rest of it. I think uh, we think this house was refronted in the 1800s and then rendered to make it look more fashionable and less red brick 17th century. That's the thing about um, big rich houses, they modernize and modernize, but they tend to modernize all the way around, leaving the core of the ancient house in the middle, which is great for archeology span because if you just build on and on, deep underground, there's a little, maybe a little remnant of um, something a lot earlier. I'll show you this so you get an idea perhaps of uh, the rest of the buildings we excavated on site. This is the smallest cellar right in the middle of the building. You may remember that from a slide about 20 ago. It's got these little alcoves on the walls. We had to stop at three foot down. These walls were beginning to subside and we didn't want them falling on our heads. But each of these little alcoves had charcoal staining on the surface. Well, on the surface, on the underside of the arch. Uh, we think that could only be from one thing. And that's when you put a candle on the shelf to light the room, which is right in the middle of the house and, of course, have no, therefore, no external windows. It, it, it's quite lovely going in rooms that people haven't been into for 50 years. Here's the foundations we exposed in 2014. Here's our cellar, that cellar we were just in there. But you can see again, just that indentated, indentated, indented front wall that we saw in the plan all the way around. We've got another large cellar at the back. Here's the remains of our ancient Hopkites building. Totally, totally not the same building represented by these large foundations. I think this large thing shows that this is actually cutting through the corner of the flint there. Also got a funny thing going on here that we think was the old front entrance. And as, as things were modern modified, you think the entrance moved around to the other side where there was a large porch. Another view of the um, foundations. What well, they've done since in the park, this has all been, it's all retained where it is. They've covered over with grass, but they've marked out the walls with um, brick and stone so, so that visitors can understand where the house was and they've put some information panels out. That's part of the outreach uh, as demanded by um, HLF. But really the biggest outreach was having, I think we had typically 10 school groups every year with um, Jill running complete hour long lessons for the children on how to do archaeology and how not to cut yourself in archaeology and what a find looks like. Here's our other cellar. Deeper brick floor, brick walls. There's something quite nice about, <laughs> something quite nice about bricks. In, in archaeology, I tend to um, enjoy most whatever I'm doing at the time. People say to me, what's your favourite period? And really, it is whatever I'm doing at the time. I've been down in Rochester looking at Roman things recently and also 19th century shipyards. So at the moment, I like Roman things and 19th century shipyards. Well, another digression. The shipyard I was looking at in Rochester was dating to 1803. was actually run by a woman. I think it's the only one in the country in 1803. I think it's Mrs. I want to say Mrs. Bell, but that's probably wrong. It comes, Mrs. Ross. There we go, Mrs. Ross's Rochester shipyard. Building ships for the Royal Navy, warships for the Navy. Remarkable. Anyway, back to East Coast. This is another part of the cellar. This is underneath the butler's room in that little room off to the back. These are, these have a lot of glass, window glass in the bottom there and in this hole over here. That's because these are light wells to allow natural light into the cellar. And in the cellar, we, we had uh, things like 
storage jars, jam jars, knives and forks, spoons, broken plates. They would suggest to me that when it was all smashed up in 1964, everything was just bulldozed into the cellar, as I may have said earlier. Also within the cellar, a part of the porch. This is all made of Portland stone. So the um, roof lintel, side parts, columns to hold up the front of the porch. That a lovely um, neoclassical porch. It's all, most of it's still in there in the cellar. Some of it we took out and is on display in the gardens, but children now use it for skateboarding on. So I'm not sure if that was the best use, but all Portland stone, all brought by the Banks family. Of course, they didn't have to buy it. They own the, um, the stone quarries at Portland. All they had to pay for was shipping, I imagine. Um, here's another part of the buildings. This is a couple of storerooms right at the back of the house, which was defined as 18th century in that survey. We've actually got two buildings in here. Um, one has quite a large wall around the outside with a little uh, small room at the back that may have held a bucket before the days of running water and flushing toilets. Certainly got another drain here, but there's an earlier building in there represented by less uh, solid and more fragmentary red bricks around the east side. This again was dug in uh, disgustingly hot weather in July 2016. And I just said to my staff, I don't make things happen. I said to my staff, what I'd really like, and volunteers, what I'd really like is a little bit of rain overnight to freshen it up and make that orange gravel show up really orange. Of course, it rained, didn't it, overnight? And I had the opportunity to make a lovely photo. Again, photographing in archaeology, as in a lot of photography, it's just a matter of catching the right moment at the right time. We've got a friend who goes bird watching, never seen a kingfisher. All our other bird watching friends see and see have seen a kingfisher. It's just about ca capturing that moment, be it in archaeology or bird watching or real life. If we go back to what we excavated, you see we'd, we've drawn a plan of everything we've done. A lot of volunteers don't like the recording. They just like taking the archaeological trowels, finding things, putting them together. But by doing this sort of thing, we discover that our main wall here, which is the main wall of Eastcote House, and measuring the bricks and looking at different phases of construction, initially it was only about two foot wide, and it's a whole other foot wide by the addition of bricks out here and out here in order to um, carry a refrontaging in the 1800s. Again, modifying and modernizing up to the most very date. If we didn't know that people modified and enlarged their houses through studies of history, we can prove it archeologically. Now we'll move on to the finds. I know certainly all our volunteers and most volunteers look and enjoy finds. This is a fragment of a Delft tile. It's our favorite one. Part of a milkmaid tile dating to about 1700. We're missing her head. Although here's her face. Is that her face on the left? That looks like her face. Her uh, body, um, pale and typical decorative motifs in the corners. These ones look a bit like um, Prince of Wales feathers, but they might be stylized flowers. Others have been found. These are more complete ones. Uh, see this one on the left, very similar to the first one we looked at. But if you ask me, the artistry is a bit rubbish. This one, if it were only complete, would be a lot better. Uh, this, this, of course, what we see there is it's brush strokes, all, all done, done by, by a painter back in the 1700s. Um, do we find gold? Some people ask. This Delft tile has a picture of a church done in, in solid colour. But yes, all these little panels of funny orange colour, that is actually all gold. You know, like you get um, gold on spode pottery, if any of you are aware of that. This is a tile decorated with gold. Probably not the cheapest and would have just been around a fireplace. That's typically where these blue and white tiles went. This one, we've only got the corner decorations. You know, that strongly says to me that someone kept the picture on the inside, which would typically of the period be um, either a, a character like that milkmaid or, or, a, or, or a landscape such as a church or a castle. Here's, a, here's another nice thing. Dalton Stoneware, Harvest Jug. This is a little fragment of a riding, chap riding. 
um, I'll come back to more of those. My slides may not be in my correct order. I'll just say a bit more about the finds. Pottery after 1540, altogether we found 2,007 fragments of pottery over four seasons, so that's 500 pieces a year. Most of it's willow pattern, but also flower pots and ginger beer bottles. The earliest pottery mostly comes from around that stone building in the meadow and from the hop kites dump in the ditch. Here's another fragment. I showed you that piece of a rider before. Here's three bits that go together showing a smoking man from a harvest jug. We had something we might call a time team moment where you get three bits of pottery and put them together and realize you've actually got a perfect figure. The, a harvest jug typically looks like that when complete. So here's the huntsman. Here's the here's the fox. Here are the dogs. Well, that might be another dog. This one's got the drinking man on it. So there's a smoking man, a drinking man, and I think a sleeping man, and the windmill. These are quite collectible. You can get modern ones for about twenty, or ones from about eighteen hundred for about two hundred pounds. Now I've been talking for fifty five minutes, but um, I can go on all night, but I will. We're going on to the finds now, and there's not that much left, after which questions can be asked and may be answered if I have an answer. I may have an answer, I may not have a right answer. So of all the coins, of all the finds we found, we only had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, sixteen coins over the whole site. One of the Henry VIII's groat, which is uh, would have looks like this at the top. There's Henry VIII. You probably recognise him from actually. Oh, ah, I'll come. I'll, I'll diverge again now. Current archaeology magazine. London, sorry, London Archaeology magazine. In the latest thing, there's a report. Someone studied the reports of Henry VIII's life, and early on in his marriage to Anne Boleyn, he fell from his horse and nearly died of brain injuries. Um, Anne was pregnant with a boy at the time and miscarried. And apparently Henry VIII's personality changed after this fall from his horse with the head injuries. I mean, does that explain everything? Anyway, but there's an article about that in the latest London Archaeologist. I digress, I digress. This lower uh, coin before is something called a jeton. A jeton is a counting token for um, working out accounts on a checkerboard, um, a bit like, a, a, so I suppose, a, a horizontal abacus but in a checkerboard shape and it's that working out with tokens on a checkerboard that leads to what the chancellor's job is in the government he's chancellor of the exchequer so their tokens a jeton is a token for working out maths on a checkerboard we had one victorian penny one george fifth farthing two george six halfpennies, and nine elizabeth the second coins all of which were pennies from 1971 uh, decimalization of course iron tools all these came out of our blacksmith area so a plowshare repairing a plow that's the hook that digs up the ground one bill hook one reaping hook two horseshoes a bolster for hammering uh, a chiseling sorry and two iron bars for smithing all these things are now it seems going to the local uh, museum in uxbridge which is local to the new museum that they're getting uh, which is local to Hillingdon, which is a borough where Eastcote is in, because the Museum of London at the moment is not taking any fines. Animal bones, people ate bone, people ate animals, of course they did. Mostly sheep, lamb and cow, but again, suitable for status, occasional venison, you're not supposed to eat deer back in the 1700s, pig, fish, chicken and of course rat. I mentioned drains earlier, where do we find rat bones? in the drains of course we do um nails nails was a common find largely because the demolition guys burnt all the house if you imagine a wooden floor the wooden floor is nailed to fl the floorboards are nailed down two nails per joist so if your floorboard covers 10 joists that's 20 nails if you've got floorboard 20 floorboards in your room each room has 400 nails if you've got 10 rooms in your house, that's 4,000 nails. It soon adds up, I tell you. It's an amazing thing, things children don't know. The youngsters are going, but I thought nails were on your fingers. No, 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 these are iron nails for hammering things together. It's wonderful how language words can have two or three meanings, like there, 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 and there. Marble, I mentioned that earlier, 69 
pieces of white Carrara marble from Italy, all chucked into the basement on demolition. And was there no was there no architectural salvage? No, probably not. Nice bits of bottles. I mentioned um, the leaded window glass, four whole kilogram of window glass, and bits of typical uh, 17th and 18th century wine bottles. Also, we got modern beer bottles. One of my favourite bottles was actually for powdered lemonade. I think it was uh, Eiffel Tower lemonade powder. It had a picture of the Eiffel Tower on the side of the bottle, so obviously it dates to after 1889. And you just added lemonade powder to fizzy water back in sort of 1910, 1920. Dilute taste, I, I suppose. Um, I just, they're not here. This shows a good demographic of the um, archaeological team. Um, Colin on the right, retired. Um, trainee school teacher here, teacher there, retired gardener. Another teacher, a council councillor who sorted it all out for us. Um, student, me, I'm the, look, there's only one person with a beer. I might have beer in this glass. Jill, uh, this chap here runs the Hertfordshire Young Archaeologist Club. He brought along a lot of his people. Um, Ex-model, poet, artist. I could go on. They all have, they've all had lives outside of archaeology, but honestly, once you, once you raise a trowel and find your first find, it seems you're bitten. And um, that was our team typically in the last week of our site back in 2018. It's all been written up now. I want to make a little glossy publication, but if it gets published anywhere, I think I'll do an article for the um, London Archaeologist magazine. Thank you very much. Um, think about questions. David or Robert will be sorting those out i believe thank you les thank you very much les that was a real tour de force um <laughs> well so um, it might have been too much detail but i believe it's been copied and it'll go online yes we're recording it so yeah um, so um anyone who wants to look at that and interrogate the facts rather than interrogating me now lead on david but uh, there are all sorts of sides you did which sort of where there's sort of like long corridors of, of <laughs> thought that I didn't have time to pursue, being rather slow of a brain. But uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, a wonderful project. What one you feel seem to feel particularly enthusiastic about? In yes, we did it for five years, and um, Jill helped teaching the children and everything. And every, just everybody loved doing it. We do it not see that wasn't done for money. That was just done because people wanted to do archaeology and interested in their local area. Most of what I get paid for is a response to a developer, but this is local people wanting to have a project and getting it off the ground and doing it and and realising that just, again, it's a pity during lockdown, we can't do it at the moment because yeah. we can't lie side by side on the ground staring at a piece of pottery going, well, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> yes, what we have lost. Are there any questions coming up? Um, there's a way to type in Zoom if you want to type a question, or you can raise a hand as well using Zoom. Uh, can I raise a real hand? <laughs> go on, Judith, yeah. Awesome. Um, when you, you said that the couple that owned it had uh, married into wealth, they married into the Banks family, and you mentioned a list of places that they owned i thought you said oakhampton but i wasn't sure yes they they had a castle at oakhampton and also at corf okay so oakhampton in devon in devon yeah. and corf in dorset okay no i'm from the west country originally so i got all excited to hear think, about oakhampton. well i think um the uh, i think um oakhampton lost their original um uh gentry during the wars of the roses right and corf took both on and then banks, I think, would be well. Banks are post um, post um, uh, uh, civil war, so everyone lost their income then. Okay, no, that was the main question I, about the other places that they owned. No, does anybody else got a question? They can shout out. I got a question. 
Uh, what happens to the site once you finish there? Is it all just filled in again and covered over? We did. We filled it in. Um, and then we relayed the grass as best we could. And now it's covered over. The, local, the locals didn't think we relayed the grass very well, so they had to pull in professional gardeners. But it's not my fault. I'm an archaeologist, not a, not a turf relayer. It's particularly difficult in clay. It just won't go back. Mm. But, but the main house in, of Hopkites, um, that has now been traced out on the surface with brick and stone. Um, so people can, I suppose that's the only lasting thing in the park is the shape of the main house has been restored to the surface so people can see where it were with, with some information boards. The mm -hmm. stable's been restored and people have been in there and occasionally have talks in there and the finds when we make them archive ready will go in the local museum. Mm. The um, Where the carriage house used to be is now a, t a tea shop and very nice it is too. But yes, we trained up a lot of people, and I, one of the um, archaeologists from the Young Archaeologist Club who came, she's called Rose. She's now fourteen, and she's got more experience than most students do leaving university. But um, some of those older volunteers, they've been on other of my sites. They just said, "Are you digging anything?" And can I come along? And sometimes we get to say yes. Like we've got one. We're supposed to be doing one for the. The Berkeley family over near Heathrow, they were, I think, one of the richest people in the 17th or 18th century. They had their own hunt, which you may have heard of, the um, Berkeley hunt. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be looking at doing community archaeology there when we're allowed to. Looking for medieval things and later things. Even garden archaeology is great fun. Jill and I worked on the Isle of Wight on... Queen Victoria's gardens, which were grassed over in the First World War because they didn't have the staff, they all went to war. And so few came back that it just stayed grass. We lifted the turf and there were all the flower beds completely visible again because you could, com you could compare the improved soil for where the flowers were with the unimproved soil where it was just grass and the gravelly bits where it was pathways. Yeah. So again, garden archeology, span medieval archeology, span buildings it's it's remarkably fun sorry that wasn't really your question your question was uh, what can you see the footprint of the house they put they put that down all right well, they stuck up some of the pillars, didn't they? yes yes they've stuck up some of the pillars from the basement that shot of the um portland stone pillars some of those bits and pieces are erected as um memoirs i suppose to the grounds there's also a dovecote there that's quite nice oh and there's a walled garden that's really nice right what's this park called sorry what's the park called east coat house gardens right um, the nearest tube is east coat although northwood hills isn't far away right rice lips not that far either right it's worth visiting in, when you can travel safely. Mm. And I suppose the cafe probably isn't open. Mm. Right. Anybody else got a question? I think Maureen's got a question. Maureen? Yeah. What is the best sort of soil for, prever for preserving things? Clay soil or dry sandy soil? Good question. Dry sandy soil only really um, uh, keep, well, it keeps um, dry things dry, if you like. And clay soil keep is more likely to retain bits of um, leather and the softer things that might decompose, like wooden handles of tools, leather clothing, clay. But it's a lot worse to dig, dig in. It's so heavy, mm -hmm. clay soil. It, it can be awful. Also, it doesn't always depend on whether it's sand or silt or clay. Sometimes the chemical composition of the soil can be slightly more acidic, especially in the sandy soils, and all animal bones and metal will disappear. Some of you may be aware of the Sutton Hoo ship burial over in Ipswich. Mm -hmm. When they found that 
it was just the imprint really of the wood that was left the soil was so acidic there i think the bones of the body had gone as well just leaving a a vague shadow on the ground so i'd say it's probably more down to the chemical composition than wetness and dryness but in general clay stays wetter until you dig it off in the hot sun and then it cracks and dries out and becomes impossible to work anybody else zoom switches to certain screens but um <laughs> uh, nick's got his hand up so, uh, how many professional archaeologists would you have on site given compared to the volunteer number of volunteers that one we had four uh me running it jill teaching the the volunteers and the um children and two other sort of site assistants professional assistants who know what they're doing to answer the questions when i'm having to deal with other questions because <laughs> With volunteers, I'll be called every 10 seconds to look at something or check something. And if we've got more than one hole being excavated, I can't split like like an amoeba. <laughs> <laughs> I need people to, to be able to um, get on with doing things if I haven't got the time. Mm. Or showing the mayor around, that's a good one. The local mayor, not the, <laughs> not, not the London mayor. Whose borough it was. And still is, I think. I think Boris's brother, borough is Hillingdon. He's the MP for Uxbridge. Yeah, yeah. The MP for Uxbridge. And it was, yes, in his constituency. But he didn't come to see it. But the local mayor did and then volunteered as well because he's an archaeologist. <laughs> Someone, one of, one of the, ch the children, one of the children actually went on, started doing maths at Cambridge hated it so much, wanted to drop out, but managed to switch to archaeology and is now in their third year of their archaeology degree. Right. Mm. Uh, Alma has a question. Um, I'm not really sure that I caught where, where um, East Court House was. I'm sorry. Oh, it's it's um, just west of Harrow. Oh, okay. Not far, uh, from, not, in not far from Riselip. Alma's in right. Canada. She says she might be slightly. Yeah. Ah, East Coast is um is a tube station on the Metropolitan Line, as it comes out of London on its way northwest towards sort of Wembley and. Oh. The near the nearest main road is the A40. I don't know okay. if that helps either. Okay, and I had another question. Yes, go ahead. Um, Unless I missed what you said, uh, but who finances your work? That one was financed by the Heritage Lottery Fund and local matched funding. The Lottery Fund will, will effectively double what you've managed to find locally. But most of my work is paid for by developers uh, in response to planning position, permission. That's what I do as a day job, is okay. developer-funded excavation. Mm. Well, sorry, given, given the um, COVID situation uh, where I am, uh, a lot of these sort of things, the, the funding is not going to be there from the government. I'm talking, you know. No, what... there, well, there's no lottery fund work at the moment. But because I'm what I'm working on is typically either schools or roads or railways, that all counts as infrastructure and is therefore essential work. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank but you. We're, no, we're not government funded at all. It's all developer paid for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. Right. Any other questions? I feel we should perhaps release Les to um, <laughs> turn to his normal life <laughs> with Jill. <laughs> yes. Thanks for thanks for the wave, Jill. <laughs> well, it's nice yeah. to see everyone yeah. because, like, Yes. This time, this time last year, some of us were in a schoolroom. Yes, and so good that Nick is with us as well. So it's sort of a real <laughs> um, throwback to better times. Yeah. <laughs> so some, some people don't like Zoom. My mum doesn't like it because 
it upsets her to not see people face to face. And this doesn't do it for her. But I'm quite enjoying, I quite enjoy Zoom. <laughs> I like seeing people. Your illustrations come up on my little Android tablet screen much better than they would in a hall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it look, looks superb, my screen. So yeah. I'd like to thank you, Les, for, um, yeah. for such a wonderful articulate talk. Well, thank you very much for listening. And, and uh, for all the experience and expertise that you've shared with us. A really, really <laughs> wonderful occasion. Um, I want to thank Robert Gay for doing all the technology that's allowed us to do Zoom, which otherwise we would not have